Hello, my name is Michael Peake, and on behalf of the Hideaway Canoe Club, I'd like to tell you about a group of northern wilderness paddlers who were our heroes. They were known as the Voyageurs, and they retraced historic canoe routes 70 years ago in a manner we follow still. So who were these guys? Though they have all passed on some time ago, some of their names will be familiar to current wilderness paddlers. Eric Morse, known as the Dean of Canadian Wilderness Canoeing, and American Sigurd Olson were both notable figures in each country's history of the North, along with awareness of it and the environment. I think this photo from Eric's files captures a lovely moment. This young boy kneeling on a dock along the Churchill River in northern Saskatchewan in the summer of 1955 is chatting with a group of men who appeared out of nowhere and are about to head off to the horizon. These six were the core of a group who were dubbed the Voyageurs after the 18th century fur traders by the Ottawa Press Corps because of their annual northern historical journeys back in a time when men in their 50s just didn't do such things. We know a fair bit about this group whom I consider my elders, and we can use their original photos and information to tell their story. So unique were their summer holidays back then that they were an item for the press. Good copy, Eric said, acknowledging their age and occupations made for an interesting story. A younger Eric Morse is shown here amongst a collection of clippings and letters and photos between the group members. They were all successful men, mostly based in Ottawa, who set a pattern so many of us had followed, whether knowingly or not. The group had its start at an Ottawa cocktail party in 1951 when Eric challenged some of the diplomats there to discover what the real Canada was like. Morse, who was national director of the Association of Canadian Clubs, also authored Fur Trade Canoe Routes of Canada, then and now, a look at travel routes to the original voyageurs who followed mainly indigenous routes established over millennia in pursuit of modern commerce. The book's foreword was written by Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau in 1968, the year it was published. He was a friend of Eric's who had been on the Coppermine River with him two years earlier. Eric's other book, published just before, just after his death, was Freshwater Saga, which details his years with the Voyageurs and when he later branched off with younger paddlers to do a series of landmark trips in the far north. He was also the author of many canoeing-related magazine stories. The Voyageurs did 10 official trips between 1952 and 64. Eric was on all but the last one. Each trip was chosen for its history and paddling interest and logistics. They began in Quetical Park in northwestern Ontario and gradually spread out as far as Great Bear Lake and the Mackenzie River. We will have a look at some of those trips and the people on them. After the 1951 cocktail challenge, Eric and a small group, including two future voyagers, did a 10-day trip in the Ottawa area, but it was here in Quetico Park in 1952 that the real Voyager trips began. That year, six paddlers, which included Morse, McLean's Magazine Ottawa correspondent Blair Fraser, and Dr. Oman Salant of the Defense Research Board and three others, did the Hunter Island Loop, as they call it in Quetico. The next year, they added Netherlands Ambassador Tony Lovink and former Major General Elliot Roger, Vice Chief of Staff, of the Canadian Army. And it was here that Sigurd Olson joined the group. This American writer and conservationist lived in northern Minnesota and knew the boundary waters in Quetico like the back of his hand. As the oldest and most experienced of the group, he became the leader, or in fur trade parlance, the bourgeois. There was now a tight bond forming with these men that would last until the end of their days. 
The next year, they were again in northwestern Ontario, paddling from Grand Portage on Lake Superior across to Fort Francis, following the traditional fur trade route, which became the international border. And it was here at the reconstruction of the original Grand Portage post that something clicked. They read this Minnesota historical marker on the fur trade and about the history of the region, and the words made it an indelible oppression which would shape the rest of their canoeing. This is the actual portage that crosses the height of land north of Superior, and it was here that original voyageurs would change from pork eaters and become hommes de nord, men of the north, and a ceremony included being sprinkled with water from the bough of a pine tree. And you can see the international marker right there where the border runs right through this portage. They were the first canoe party in many years to do the route right through to Fort Francis and are shown at the falls here on the Namican River west of Quetico. As part of their newfound love of history, they interviewed this man, Billy Wilson, an 87-year-old former steamboat pilot who arrived in Fort Francis in 1881 by way of the Dawson Trail, which was a series of portages and barges which ran through Quetico and westward. It was the precursor of the Transcontinental Railway. And of course, they would pose for the shirtless photos. And the newcomer in this group is the second from the left, John Endeman, who was the South African ambassador to Canada. He was a one-tripper. Being a journalist, Blair Fraser wrote up some of their trips. For example, this one in a lovely spread in Maclean's magazine. This gave them some national exposure. The Ottawa Journal also started printing annual stories on their summer adventures, but I, I don't think they ever sought out fame. Their next trip was on the Churchill River in northern Saskatchewan in 1955. It became their most celebrated journey, largely due to this superb book, on the trip by Sigurd Olson. That was actually not published until 1961. The Lonely Land gives you a feel for what it would have been like to travel with this group through this superb area of canoeing with river and lake expansions and very few bugs, fortunately. Planning for the trip found the well-dressed canoeist posing for a newspaper photo along with that beautiful 4x5 camera quality. Left to right are Omen Salant, Eric Morse, newcomer Danny Kulikan, and Tony Lovink. The Churchill was a wonderful trip, albeit in very high water. Good weather, great rapids, and pleasant company guaranteed a memorable time. The river was still traveled by the Crees of North Saskatchewan, though often now in motorboats. Eric said the group learned how to properly paddle canoes in rapids from watching the Crees do it here. There were several railways at portages to speed gear along, which was a very welcome sight to a weary paddler or portager. Black Trout Rapids is easily distinguishable by that canoe-eating diagonal curling wave in the middle. The short set was fun to run for empty for us 34 years later, having learned from Bill Mason and others about whitewater technique. Sid poses with some young kids at Stanley Mission, a famous spot on the river, and the site of the oldest church in Saskatchewan. The town used to be built around that North Shore place of worship until the Hudson's Bay Company built their store on the South Shore and everyone moved over, except the church. They ran into Father Louis Moreau, an oblate missionary, for 50 years in the region until he retired in 1965. He had a strong effect on Sig, who devoted a chapter to him in the Lonely Land. 
Also a part of this and every trip was Eric's nightly readings of historical journals related to the area they were traveling through. While the Churchill flows east into Hudson Bay eventually, the fur trade route turns south on the Sturgeon Weir heading down to the Saskatchewan River. Here at this historic travel spot, Frog Portage, they met Harry Moody, the guy in the hat in the middle, who was doing archaeological work at the heavily traveled site. That accounts for the outboard motor. There's also a superb railway on this carry. Their final destination was Cumberland House, founded by Samuel Hearn in 1774, the first inland HBC post. Here's a photo of the guys meeting with locals and working out lots of logistical details, no doubt, at the trip's end. Of course, after all the talking's done, off come the shirts for the usual group shot with newcomer Denny Kulikan, head of the Canadian Banknote Company, on the far right as the Saskatchewan River stretches out behind them. In 1956, Eric and Tony and two other non-voyageurs got together for a trip in central Manitoba through the God's Lake area. They were back to their bigger trip with the usual company in 1957. This is what one of their annual reports look like. They offer a day-by-day summary, complete with photos. One 1956 newcomer was Tyler Thompson, the U.S. Minister to Canada. He also joined the group in the 57 trip from Wollaston Lake to Reindeer Lake and then down the Fond du Lac River to Stony Rapids. It was on this trip that Sig misplaced his wallet at Wollaston Lake. However, it was waiting for him intact in Stony Rapids at the end of the trip after being found by a native woman who dried the contents and delivered it to the RCMP. It made the route north in much more comfort than he did. In 1959, they did their northernmost journey. This group of eight paddled the Campsell River north to Great Bear Lake and then down the Great Bear River to Norman Wells on the Mackenzie. This classic press photo from that trip is iconic. Left to right, it's Omen Salant, Sig Olson, Denny Kulikan, newcomer Tyler Thompson, Eric Morse, Blair Fraser, a one-timer Harry Fast, and... Elliot Roger. This was a tough trip for the group now in their late 50s. They had very cold weather and the first half of the trip took its toll with a lot of overgrown portages and unrunnable rapids. It was also the furthest north they had ever been and perhaps were not prepared for it. There are a few photos of the guys looking beat. The Camsel is not a well-traveled river. So they had a tough going. Even the bourgeois looked better weather beaten. This is a well-known photo of a lean and cold Blair Fraser. When I first saw this picture, I knew something was wrong and I wondered if he was sitting on someone, but no, he's actually wearing two pairs of pants after the leg of one burned and he needed the extra warmth. It was such a cold trip. It's interesting to see some of their camping supplies on the rock there, including canned butter, which is now almost extinct. They were happy to reach Great Bear Lake, where some business friends who ran the El Dorado Mine on the lake said they would pick them up in a boat and treat them to hot showers and piles of food at Port Radium. I'm sure they were thinking shades of the Quetico pickups several years ago. They were somewhat surprised when the boat arrived. The radium Gilbert, named after Gilbert Labine, who discovered uranium in the area, was more like a ship and hoisted their canoes on the deck for the trip to Port Radium. The boat later dropped them off across the lake at the mouth of the Great Bear River. I was puzzled by this photo at first. I wasn't sure what the names meant. What what could they mean? And it was Pamela Morris who answered that question for me. 
the name is the first two letters of each paddler in the boat. So Moro was Morrison Roger, Cool was Kulik and Olson, and so on. This was one tradition the HACC's Peak Brothers did not follow, for obvious reasons, if you think about it. The trip down the Great Bear is swift and fun. In fact, they even had time to climb Mount Charles partway down to get a magnificent view of the Mackenzie River Valley. They stopped into Fort Norman, now called Tulida, at the junction of the Mackenzie, a historic jumping-off point for Barrenland's trips. He talked with this old-timer and met the locals before heading downstream to Norman Wells, where they finished. There's a lovely group shot of the gang here, all scrubbed up and changed into fresh clothes at the furthest point north of their travels, except for Eric. Eric Morris, in his memoir, Freshwater Saga, wrote of Omen Salant, pictured here, quote, Omen had the important position of brewmaster. The evening drink before dinner, all chores done, was a hallowed time and the precious ration called for serious attention. In our first year of canoeing, Tony had introduced us to overproof rum, the nearest thing to dehydrated alcohol, and obviously the answer for long canoe trips. It did not take us long to evolve what we consider the best rum cocktail, a daiquiri made by adding lemon powder, sugar, and water, which has now become well known among Canadian canoeists as Voyager's Punch. It has the delightful property of making one oblivious to the bugs although there is a theory the lemon drives the bugs away. We did carry a little extra alcohol above our daily ration of two ounces for celebrations and emergencies. Omen once brilliantly declared a celebration because there was no emergency. Now, he had a double doctorate and was the gold medal winner at U of T, so a brilliant man. And in addition, uh, obviously highly effective bartender, as this slide illustrates. Voyageurs on the rocks. It was perhaps not coincidental that during this period, Elliot Roger became the head of the Manitoba Liquor Commission. There would be only two more Voyager trips, one in 1961 on the Lower Churchill and Rat Rivers going from Puckatawagan to Thompson, and in 1964 on a voyage to Hudson Bay on the Hayes River. They definitely like this land of little sticks, as the central Manitoba area is called. This photo is the final frame of the Voyager's 10-year canoeing saga. Here on the shore of Hudson Bay at the mouth of the Hayes River, Eric missed this trip as he was further north with younger companions, more able to cope with barren lands travel. Eric's group did the Thelon in 1962, one of the earliest down that legendary river. This is the last photo I took of Eric at his home in the Gatineau in January 1986, after a nice lunch and a round of Stilton and Port. The HACC had named a river after him a few months earlier. And we got to be quite chummy and close. He passed away in mid-April at the age of 82. When Eric started paddling in the Barrens, he realized he would need more logistical help with canoes. There were no roads or trains nearby. In 1963, he used his connections and persuaded the Hudson's Bay Company to start a U paddle service where canoes could be picked up at one point and dropped at the other. This is the brochure for that service. It was a godsend to northern paddlers. Ironically, we had the support of the HBC for our Morse River naming trip, but they canceled the service two months before we, we left. I, I used to stare at this brochure longingly. It looked so incredibly adventurous and seemingly out of reach. I always wondered who the paddlers on the rapids on the cover were. And here they are in the original photo. Turns out that the bow paddler was Angus Scott, father of our Hideaway Canoe Club original Peter Scott. In the stern, Pierre Trudeau. 
two years before he became prime minister here in 1966. They're paddling a large rapid out of Point Lake at the start of the Coppermine River. The HACC also acquired this rare, though poor quality, video of Eric and Pierre paddling together, looking for a campsite on the Coppermine, hence they're both on the same side, and also Trudeau doing some solo paddling, bringing in some scarce firewood, it would appear. I sent this video to Justin Trudeau a few years ago, and he wrote back a very nice note thanking me as he had very pleasant memories of his father and canoeing. And here comes Monsieur Trudeau now. As you can see, he, he knows how to handle a canoe. The years moved on and the group was getting near the end. They would get together for special events and dinners, at which they certainly dressed elegantly. I'm not sure what's in those bags. But it was not all happy events. On one of their regular spring trips on the Petawawa River in Algonquin Park, Blair Fraser was killed in Rollway Rapids while paddling with Elliot Roger on May 12, 1968. They were swept into the large rapid and Blair hit his head and drowned. During the fur trade, when a voyager died on the trail, it was customary to bury him on the spot and raise a crude wooden cross. That fall, in Blair's memory, a bronze cross was erected overlooking the rapid, his ashes buried beneath. The cross read simply, In memory of Blair Fraser, erected by his fellow voyageurs. There's a lovely obit of him in Maclean's magazine, which is actually chock full of interesting info, and it's available online. Sig Olson was unable to attend, but asked these words be read at the small private ceremony held in September. The first to go of our group makes us more conscious of the strong bonds of love and loyalty that have been welded together through our experiences. Though he can no longer be with us, we know his spirit will be at every campfire, and when we run the rapids of the future, or fight the big waves on the lakes, or struggle across the portages, he will be there too. Sig Olson died in January 1982, and the voyageurs erected a plaque for their fallen bourgeois at his cabin in Ely, Minnesota. He uh, had a writing cabin where he used to do a lot of his work. You can see that picture of Blair with the two pants on and a photo of his cross on the wall. That cabin was preserved and contains the last words he wrote before going out for a snowshoe jaunt and dying of a heart attack. A new adventure is coming up, and I'm sure it will be a good one. If it's half as good as the ones he had... I don't think we could ask for anything more. For the Hideaway Canoe Club, this is Michael Peake.